for those of you who've joined us before, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who haven't, it's, it's nice to see you. Uh, this is the, the third session of a, a series of training sessions we've been running as part of what we're calling the River Raiders Project. Now uh, you can see on my title screen here uh, that the River Raiders Project is part of a wider uh, Brex, Fen Edge and Rivers Landscape Partnership Project, which is funded by uh, the Heritage Fund, as it's known these days, uh, and presented by the Breckland Society. And I'm Richard Hoggett, and I'm the, the project officer for the River Raiders Strand. Uh, now, I mentioned that River Raiders is part of this wider uh, Brex, Fen Edge and Rivers Landscape Partnership scheme. Uh, this is a project which uh, pertains to the study area that you can see in the map on the left hand side of the screen there you can see the blue line um, picking out uh, several of the river corridors really that run down the western side of the Breckland area and cut across it uh, taking in some of the major settlements but also taking in uh, varied areas of, of landscape character as well primarily uh, river Rhine, but also running up the river valleys and during the course of the project there's numerous different uh, sub-projects being delivered on a variety of themes, uh, all of them with the, the overarching aim, as you can see stated there, uh, to understand, reveal, celebrate and protect the lost heritage of the Brex, Fen, Edge and Rivers. And when we use heritage there, uh, we're talking about heritage in its broadest sense. Uh, so on the one hand, we're talking about what um, perhaps we should be calling cultural heritage, which is, is the sort of heritage we're dealing with here today, uh, but it also takes in uh, natural heritage as well in the form of ecology and the riverine environment and so on. So it's a, a very broad heading that we're working under. Uh, the main uh, mission objective, if you like, of the, the Fen Edge project is to raise awareness of how water is fundamental to the story of landscape settlement and development, its biodiversity and to many of its existing and future risks. And so again, that's where you can see the cultural heritage aspect of what we're doing today fits in there because as I'm sure many of you will be familiar and those of you who've been to the previous seminars will, will be aware the, the the rivers and the both in terms of the, the navigation which they offer but also the sustaining uh, life force in the form of, of water and natural resources are absolutely fundamental to the origins and development of human settlement within the, the Brex and Fenage area and the previous sessions which I'll allude to again in a moment both of which are available as, as video recordings on the, the Project YouTube channel, looked at the Anglo-Saxon and the Viking presence within the Brex and the study area in particular, um, both in terms of the use of the natural resources, uh, primarily driven by the water, um, but also the use of, of the river network as a, a set of, of navigable channels. Now within the, the Fen Edge and Rivers Landscape Partnership, as I mentioned, there's uh, numerous different projects of which this is one. And you can see that we're aiming to restore rivers with sensitive freshwater habitats, with communities encouraged to value heritage and given the skills to maintain them. And so you've got a, a lot of different objectives at, at work there. Now I'm just going to leave my contact details on the screen for a moment there, just uh, so that if you do want to uh, follow up on any of those other aspects of the project, you can. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll switch to my other view. So if I I don't save that one. Here we go. This is the insight into my online world. Um, this is a page I've created on my own website, uh, which just has a series of the, the links to the different resources that I'm going to take you through today. And so um, what I'm going to do is just work through those links and take you through um, some of those different resources that are available to you. The intention is really just to give you a flavour of what's out there and encourage you to, to go off and explore more uh, on your own and see if we can boost the, the number of hits on these websites from uh, uh, from one session. And so I've divided them up into to broad categories and the, the first category on my list is archaeological sites and, and historic buildings. And so when we're dealing with the Anglo-Saxon period and the Viking period in particular, um, although we do have some historical sources, we're primarily dealing with archaeological material. And so in order to find out more about the archaeological materials in our own particular areas. Uh, what we can do is we, we're resorting to um, things which uh, are found in the ground and um, physical monuments around us, um, earthworks, for example, 
and as we get towards the end of the Anglo-Saxon period and into the Norman period, some of the very early historic buildings as well, um, places like Norwich Cathedral, for example, um, Thetford Castle and so on, belonging to that early Norman phase. Now, in terms of, of where you go to find out about archaeological sites and, and monuments, uh, we direct you towards a, a series of institutions called Historic Environment Records. And a historic environment record is basically the, the database which is kept by primarily each local county council, uh, which records all of the known archaeology from within that particular county. And so there's a network of them across the country. Uh, most of them, as I say, hosted at county council level. Uh, a few of them are, are district based. So places like Colchester, for example, or Peterborough have their own. Um, but most of them, we've got Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, Cambridgeshire, for example, um, each has their own. And they're all slightly different. They've all grown up in different ways. Uh, most of them founded in the 1970s, but, but each of them then gone in a slightly different direction. And so uh, the two main sources that we want to use for uh, working in the Brex are the, the Norfolk Historic Environment Record for that area, which, which is obviously in Norfolk, and its equivalent in, in Suffolk. Now, both of those databases are hosted by the county councils, and both of them have versions of those databases which are available online through a pair of websites called the, the Norfolk and Suffolk Heritage Explorers. And so um, we'll start with the Norfolk Heritage Explorer website um, here, which is, the, is run by the, the Norfolk Historic Environment Service and provides, as well as the ability to search all of the archaeological records for the area, uh, also provides a, a large amount of, of supporting material as well. So what I'll do, here's the, the website on the screen. I'll just go into the search records function to start with, just to give you a very basic idea of what is available. We'll start with a simple search because that's the, the best way to go. Um, what we can do, you can see on the drop downs here, you can choose a keyword if you want or a time period. So on my time periods list here, uh, I'm going to go here for, uh, we'll go for um, late Saxon, or actually no, we'll go for Saxon in general, um, Saxon in general. And then the parishes, you can have everything or you can just choose a parish that you want. And so uh, I'm going to jump down to uh, Thetford because it's just a good example to choose. And it's already telling me we've got 823 records for Anglo-Saxon Thetford. So I click on the search button. Hopefully my broadband stays standing. Here we go. And so what you're given is a, a long list of records. And you can see each of these records has a, a reference number. I'm just going to zoom out slightly on, on that. Just to, there we go. Um, so each of those records has a reference number and a name. And so we'll start at the top. I'm not going to read them all to you, but just give you an idea of what you've got there. You can see there's quite a, a variety of things mentioned in the summaries there. The top one, the site of St Ethelreda's Church and um, Saxon occupation site, part of the scheduled town area. So if I just click on that link, that takes us through to a much more detailed summary. And so um, in here, you can see we've, we've got a, a description of the, the church itself, where it stood. And what the record does is it describes all of the various different archaeological excavations and discoveries which have been made in that particular area over time. And you can see they've all got dates attributed to them. If I keep scrolling down, uh, you then get a list of, of search terms. Basically, these are all the different types of archaeological feature which have been identified, which we're able to search on. So you can see churches on there, but you've also got things like uh, ditch there as well and, and various other things. And then you've got the same with the list of archaeological objects that came from it too. You see quite a long list here. And then at the bottom, you've got references to um, other sources where you can find out more about that particular record. And so that's just taking one example at random. If we jump back, you can also show the records on the map as well. Uh, and this is, um, oh, here we go, Let's zoom in on that slightly. And uh, th this is the, the map showing you the results. So we can zoom in on Thetford. The purple is the, the area we're looking at. If I just close that for a second. So these are all the Anglo-Saxon records for Thetford and you can see them overlaid onto the, uh, the map on the, the, the uh, Google image here. Uh, so you've got all the different records in here. And what we can do is we can use the tools that we're given to so click on a particular record and it tells us what it is. So uh, I can just click on that one, for example, and I'm told it's the late Saxon rubbish pit. If I come down here and click on here, this one gives me Thetford Castle. And so again, I can then click on the link and 
hopefully it will take me through what it should do. So is that for Castle? No, it's not going to. Okay, fine. But um, that gives you the, the record for Thetford Castle. So you can see here it's a, a combination of spatial data in the sense of a mapped area linked to a detailed description of, of what's there. And going through the search, you can do it, as I said, simply where you just go by parish and time period, or you can go through the more advanced search where you can search for particular types of feature. So if I want to find abbeys or castles, for example, I can. Uh, if I want to search for particular time periods, I can uh, and filter it that way. And then I've also got, it's not quite working here, but I can search by a grid reference as well. So it lets me search my local area. And then the third way of doing the, the searching is through the map itself. And so again, I can switch on all the local records. And what you can see here is a contrast to what I was showing you just now. The first map I was showing you had um, the purple areas, which were just our search results. This one is showing us everything. And on here you have a mixture of different things being recorded. So the red areas are large areas of archaeological finds and discoveries. The orange are areas where individual artifacts are being discovered. Uh, you've again got blue on here as well, which is giving you historic buildings. And of course, this is showing you everything of all periods. And so within the Norfolk Historic Environment Record, you've got over 50,000 records pertaining to the entire county. And those records range from the very, very earliest material, uh, things like hand axes being discovered up at Haysborough, for example, uh, running right the way through to Second World War military features and Cold War features, which are, are recorded as well. So you've got really the whole spread of, of human history uh, in there. And as I say, you can explore, or you can just click through the map, uh, it will give you what you're interested in and then uh, you should be able to follow those records. Uh, so that's how a historic environment record works and then if there's material on there that you're interested in and there are reports that are mentioned on there that you want to find out more about, uh, you can contact the, the team who manage the, the historic environment record and they can provide you with additional information. Um, but down the side here as well as the, the database and the searches, you can also see uh, links to large numbers of other uh, pieces of work which have taken place in here. There's a link to the Breaking New Ground project in here, for example, with resources from the, the previous project we did in the Brex. And then you've got uh, exploring more, you've got some different things. One of the more useful things in here is the parish summaries, for example. If I just take you to those, what you have here is a, an alphabetical list of all the parishes in the county. And within that, you then have um, historical summaries. So if we go to Thetford, uh, you then have a, a detailed a historical summary which cross references you can see the numbers in the text here which cross references back to those individual records that i've just been showing you and takes you through from the origins of thetford um, right the way through and then you have multiple pages for thetford because there's so much so i was broken link there as well and this is the the anglo-saxon and viking uh, bit of, of writing here about thetford uh, which takes you right the way through to the foundation of the castle so there's a lot of information there on the, the Norfolk Historic Environment Record, uh, which is worth querying, uh, worth having a, a, a search. And as I say, depending on where you live, uh, you, you can find out all kinds of exciting things uh, about where you live and what's been found nearby. Now, it should be stressed, of course, that there is a degree of, of suppression on the data here as well. So anything that would constitute treasure, for example, anything that would put a big red cross on the map for a, a treasure hunter, uh, has been suitably suppressed. So you're not quite dealing with a complete data set here, um, but it's certainly giving you plenty of information to go on. So uh, that's the Norfolk historic environment record. Uh, the Suffolk equivalent uh, is the same idea, but slightly different. As I say, they all grew up in parallel. So each county had slightly different ways of doing things. And the, the Suffolk Heritage Explorer has recently been revamped. So those of you that, that have used it before might find it doesn't look like it used to. And here again, exactly the same principle. Uh, so here you've got a, a much more free search interface. So if I just type in Vikings in here, for example, um, it gives me, uh, here we go, Vikings, here we go. Uh, so this is the list of uh, records that come back when you just do a quick search for, for Viking. Uh, obviously, if I were being more nuanced about what I was looking for, it would, it would produce uh, more results. And so um, if I just click on that first one, for example, Again, you can see this is a, a metal detected Viking type uh, bronze mount. It gives us a nice map with a dot on it showing us where it came from, because we we're obviously less worried about that in Suffolk than, than Norfolk. 
and uh, some information, some background to when it was found, where it was found and, and so on. And the ability to leave additional comments of your own at the bottom of the page there too, uh, should you wish to do so. And if you create an account with the website, you can start to add your own information. Uh, in terms of other searches, uh, we can um, go to the, the more advanced again, where you've got the, the parish drop downs, for example, and the time periods again, same as I showed you before. And then here, the map search is slightly more sophisticated and um, technology having come on a, a long way uh, in the intervening period. Uh, this is focusing on Ipswich to start with, but it uh, gives you the, the right idea. And again, you can see different classes of data. So here we've got the monuments switched on on the left hand side. Uh, we can switch on scheduled monuments instead if we want to, uh, which gives us the, the legally protected areas. Uh, this is again within Ipswich, but you get the idea. Uh, we can switch on listed buildings if we want to. Uh, and we can switch on what are called events as well. So events are recording areas of archaeological fieldwork that perhaps didn't find anything or which correlate to the, uh, the monument record. So an event finds something and the monument tells us what, what was found. So the combination of the two gives us all the information we need. So there's a lot of material there. And then on here again, under find out more, uh, you have, as you can see, uh, useful resources. You've got things about West Stowe on here. You've got World War II. Um, the Paleolithic, you've got the Rendlesham project, which has a, a large amount of Anglo-Saxon resources linked to it, which are well worth exploring. And uh, so there's a lot more material there than just the basic records again. So um, well worth spending some time on both of those. And those of you who are going to volunteer to put the booklet together, we're going to be using the, the material in the historic environment records to uh, shed some light on the period and, and bring um, particular sites to uh, to the fore uh, and bring them to people's attention and we'll obviously be highlighting these resources as part of the uh, the booklet as well. So Norfolk and Suffolk Heritage Explorers are, are both well worth a look. Now I mentioned that um, historic environment records exist for, for almost every county across the country so again depending on where you are and what you're trying to find out about it's a resource that you can query uh, on a national level and uh, there is a, a website called the Heritage Gateway uh, which attempts to bring together all the different uh, online HERs, as we call them, and allow you to query that data. And so I've just set up a quick search in here just based on the search parameters it gives you. I'm, I'm using Thetford and I've set a, a five kilometer selection area around Thetford. So if I just click that and hope it works, uh, it will give you the results. And what you can see is happening here is it's querying a variety of different national data sets. And so on here, you can see the Norfolk and Suffolk HERs at the bottom here, as you would expect. Uh, and then it's giving us returns for others that don't match the searches, but then it's also giving us uh, links back to uh, national resources as well. So the National Heritage List for England, which I'll come to in a second, for example, uh, on there. And then the, um, the Historic Milestone Society database is being searched online here as well. Uh, if milestones are your thing, and I know that some of you are interested in milestones, um, there's a, an online database of those as well. So uh, again, wherever you are in the country, wherever you're trying to, to research, again, this is a very useful starting point. And again, it allows you to identify relevant sites. Now at the top of that list there, you've got the National Heritage List for England. And that's what I'm coming to now, because I've mentioned already uh, the existence of scheduled monuments. I've mentioned the existence of listed buildings as well. And these are nationally recognised designations, we call them. These are areas which are legally protected or buildings which are legally protected. And again, if we want to find out more about where they are and, and what they are, uh, then the place that we need to go to find out about them is Historic England, which is the, the body who is responsible for curating this information. And Historic England uh, maintains what's called this National Heritage List for England, and there's a website here which you can search. Now, again, you can search by text, so you can search by postcode, for example, um, or as I prefer, you can work from the map. So I'm just going to take you through to their map search and show you how that works. So if you want to know about scheduled monuments in your area, listed buildings in your area, and find out a bit more about them, this is where you go. So I'm just going to type in a place, and here I'm just going to type in Thetford again and just give it. A, uh, a search. So you've got lots of different Thetfords in here. There are several in the country, as you can see. Uh, we're going for the Breckland Thetford. And so what it gives us again here, just to zoom out slightly, gives us that map of Thetford showing us in red 
the areas of the scheduled monuments. Those are the legally protected archaeological sites. And then the little blue triangles are the uh, listed buildings, which is giving you here. And we can check that on the key where it tells you what you're looking at here. And so if we click on one uh, here, for example, this is giving us the, the Castle Hill. And the map changes as I zoom in so I can get a bit more detail. Castle Hill, Motton Bailey Castle, Iron Age Earthwork Enclosure, and the site of, of an Augustinian friary. So if I want to know more about that specific site, I can click on there to view the list entry and it will load a, a more detailed discussion. So I get the details, I get a detailed map, and I can download that map if I want to. And then in here, I get a, a long written history about Thetford Castle and what we know, and then uh, a bit more detail about the previous field work which has been undertaken on the site, for example. And then when we get to the bottom, a series of references here again, uh, which points us towards further resources. And so again, the National Heritage List for England, as this is, uh, is an incredibly useful resource. If I just skip back, ooh, what do I need? Uh, no, that's okay. Um, we'll just skip back and it will reload hopefully. And then I can just click on another one, but you get the idea, here we go. So if I zoom out slightly, uh, and you can see the list of buildings on here as well. So if I just click on one of those, for example, let's take that one at random, 19 Guildhall Street, view the list entry, and that gives you a bit more information. Again, you might live in a listed building, uh, you might want to know which listed buildings there are on your street. And here you have a, a description. And again, what you can do is there's a, a process called enriching the list. Uh, and if you wish to, you can create a, a user account. You can see there's a sign in box at the top here. And you can add your own photos and additional information. You can see at the bottom here, you've got additional pictures being added. So again, you know, depending on what you find out, what you want to do, uh, you can add information to the, the national list. So that's the, the designations, that's historic environment records. But if we want to find out more about individual artifacts, the historic environment records will mention them. But many, in many instances, the, the best place to go to find out more about artifacts is the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Now, the Portable Antiquities Scheme was founded uh, 20 years ago or so now. And the idea of this particular scheme is run out of the British Museum. And it has a network of what are called fines liaison officers across the country, again, usually based at, at a county level. And they work closely with metal detectorists and members of the public to record and identify uh, archaeological objects which are discovered either by chance, out walking or on ploughed fields, uh, or through metal detector surveys in particular. And that material is recorded, it goes back to the owners and the landowners, and it, it, the, the details of the information are added in to the database which is maintained by the Portable Antiquity Scheme itself. And in the case of Norfolk, the information is also doubled up and added to the historic environment record. And in the case of Suffolk, the information sits alongside the historic environment record in parallel, so they're, they're not integrated in Suffolk. So when we're trying to research individual artefacts, for example, in Norfolk, we could use the, the historic environment record for both. In Suffolk, we have to use both databases in parallel. And so the Portable Antiquity Scheme itself has a, a very good website, so which you can see on the screen at the moment. Uh, lots of information. The main bit, of course, is the database itself. Uh, but then we also have links to publications and reports uh, different research and all the contact details for the local offices and so on. Uh, if we want to search the database, you've got a very simple search in the centre here. Um, so if we just start with, um, let's just start with Viking, uh, let's start with Viking Norfolk, shall we? How if I spell Viking properly? There we go. So we'll search for that um, and then we'll click search. Here we go. Right, here we go. So just searching on that very basic query of, of Viking and Norfolk, uh, already I'm brought back with a, a string of records here. And you can see that most of these records are illustrated with photographs. Now, as you're not logged in as full users, the, the locational information here is, is to the nearest parish usually. So it sort of gives you a general idea of what's where. As part of the project, we'll obviously be able to get access to more detailed information about specific find spots. Um, but at this level, at least we, we get to study the material. So just to scroll down and show you, you can see this material is constantly coming in uh, in here. So these are as recently as last month. Uh, this one is a, a stirrup. You can see a, a sort of corroded stirrup there. Uh, this next one down is a disc brooch. Uh, and again, decorated in 
a Scandinavian style. You can see that starting to corrode on there. Um, and then this third one, this is nice. This is an ingot. Uh, so again, this is, is precious metal um, being hammered into an ingot. And you can see the hammer impressions on the, uh, the ingot there. And the ingots in particular are a, a particularly um, good indication of a Scandinavian presence, both in terms of the weight of the ingot, but also the fact that it's being used for trade. And so if we click on the number here, uh, it gives us more detail. So we can go into the record here. Uh, there's a more detailed photograph, it's a really nice one. And again, these photographs are on, as you can see, on the, the Creative Commons license. So these are able to be used and reused in publications and so on. And so with the, with the booklet, with the online resources, one of the things we want to do is, is use this database to highlight some of those key resources and start to uh, publicize some of these finds because all these objects are pouring in all the time, but people don't have the, the time or the, the option to sit down and, and create a synthesis to put them all together and tell a story. And so one of the things we're able to do through the project here is, is take this information and make sense of it. So when we look at where this is from, again, it only gives us a, a very basic location because we don't want people to, to be out metal detecting for treasure particularly. And so here the location is given as Westacre. Uh, so off to the, the north, uh, northwest of Swaffham, uh, as you can see. So sort of the edge of the Brex here, really. Um, but a Scandinavian object from the Brex area, you know, again, these are the kinds of things that we're looking for when we're wanting to put together uh, the evidence for the, the Viking presence in the area. And so uh, we've got different things. Um, just scrolling down the list again, you can see a variety of things. This one's a nice one. I'll just open this one as well. This is another of the kind of thing we're looking at. Uh, this is a gaming piece. And so again, one of the uh, one of the, the sort of key pieces of evidence, if you like, is not the treasure. Uh, it's the mundane objects that help us to, to see what's going on. And so something like this is a small, it's almost like a little lead symbol, um, but it's just a little lead gaming piece uh, used to, to, to play a board game, a Viking board game. And there are parallels here with other places where we know that the Vikings were encamped and so again when we look at the, the location for this one for example uh, we're looking at Brunton Holm this time so we're heading out again towards the uh, the Fen Edge here but again exactly the kind of thing we should be looking for and exactly the kind of place that, that we would expect to find it and so this again is another key object and if we do a query on the database we start to find plenty of others like it so a very very useful set of, of materials contained there within the Water Antiquity Scheme database and as I say, you can query that for all periods. They don't just record uh, Anglo-Saxon and Viking. They're recording everything from earliest work flints right the way through to about the 18th century. So there's a, a large amount of material in there. And again, you can query it by place as well if you want to know what's been found near you. Now that then brings us on to some of the more national collections. I mentioned that the, the Portable Antiquity Scheme is sort of local materials being collected, but then once that material is collected, some of it goes back to the landowners. Other aspects of that material come back to the museums. And of course, the most important materials, some of the, the most nationally significant materials end up in, in the national museums. And so uh, starting at the top, we have the British Museum, which holds an enormous amount of material from across the world, not just British, uh, and includes a lot of East Anglian material. And perhaps most famously, of course, it holds the Sutton Hoo treasure, uh, which has been in the media a lot recently with the release of the dig, for example. Um, but for the purposes of our project, it also holds material from Brandon and from the, the Brex area, which is absolutely crucial to our understanding of the Viking period. So again, uh, the online collection from the British Museum has a very simple search interface if you want it to. Uh, if we just type in um, a, a very simple, I, I'm going to look for the, the burials that we know were found at, at Santon. So just type in Santon, um, very quick search, here it comes. So this is all the material that we have from Santon. Obviously it incorporates everything. So you've got Neolithic uh, stonework here. Some of them have photos, not all of them do. And what we can then do is we can narrow it down if we want to. And uh, so if we go for um, image only, for example, we can switch on uh, images only. So we're taking out records that aren't there with, with a picture. And then here we start to find the things I'm interested in, these oval brooches. So I can go into this record and these are showing us the uh, pair of oval brooches which were discovered in the 19th century at, at Santon, which belonged to a Viking burial. And these are, are um, an absolutely exquisite pair of, of brooches. 
uh, which were discovered, as I say, uh, they're now in the British Museum, as you can see. But on this record, you have a, a detailed description. It gives you cross references to, to what it is. You can see down the side here, you've got comments, you've got references, you've got where it's on display, which exhibition it's been in and so on, uh, all down the side there. But what you've also got here as well at the bottom is a little image gallery. And so we can scroll through those images and it shows us different views of those objects. And we can blow those up and have a, a good look at the detail if we want to. And so if we switch to that one, for example, and zoom in on that, you can see, you can take it right the way in and look at the, the quality of the, the metalwork on there, for example. And so an incredibly useful resource, that one. And uh, in terms of, of other objects, this one also tells us that it's a pair with this one. So we've got two brooches together, each has its own record, but they're there as a pair. But it also tells us that the, uh, the object was found with this object here. And again, if we go back to the search menu, uh, just go back up here to the search, new search in there. I've just cut and pasted that reference. Uh, so we'll stick that in there and give a search for that, uh, which was found with. And so you've got the oval brooches, there's the pair. And then you've got here as well a record for a sword. This one doesn't have an image, um, but it tells us that the, the brooches were found uh, with a sword as well. So we've got some information there. Uh, an iron sword with a down curved guard, a uh, trilobate pommel with an up curved bar at the base. And so this is a, a Viking sword from the same burial. And there's much discussion about whether uh, this is a double burial. You know, was it the burial of a man and a woman together? Um, or was it the burial of a, a man buried with a sword and brooches or a woman buried with a sword and brooches? We're, we're just not sure. And so one of the things we're hoping to investigate a bit more fully is that Santon burial in particular and its context. And working with the Thetford Museum, there is a hope that uh, it might be possible to borrow some of these objects from the British Museum and have them on display in Thetford as part of the exhibition that we're talking about. But uh, it's early days on that, so we just have to, to wait and see. Now, in terms of other objects from the area which are particularly exciting in the British Museum, just while we're here, I'll just show, oops, not Brandon, Brandon even. I'll just show you Brandon. I uh, hate having people looking over my shoulder. And uh, so I'll show you the, uh, so some of the material from Brandon again. As you would expect, there's a, an enormous amount of material from Brandon of various different things, a lot of it flint work, uh, as you might expect. I'm just going to narrow my filters because the object that I'm looking for is here. That's the one. This is um, perhaps one of the more famous objects from Brandon. And again, sort of highlights the significance of what's going on in the Anglo-Saxon period in this Brexham Fenage area. Uh, this is a small gold plaque. Again, if we want the dimensions, we scroll down. 34 millimetres square, so a tiny little thing really. Uh, one of four, this one has St John the Evangelist. You've, uh, you've got Matthew, Mark and Luke still out there somewhere. And uh, this was almost certainly mounted on the front of an Anglo-Saxon Bible or uh, equivalent. So you've got the little holes here where it would have been mounted. And this was a, a detector find from Brandon in the 1970s, which preceded the major period of the excavations which took place in Brandon. Uh, which revealed uh, much more about the Anglo-Saxon settlement. I'll come on to Brandon and the excavations a little bit later on. Um, but this is an absolutely exquisite object. And again, if we look at some of the other photos of it, they, they all should be much the same, but uh, it gives you a very, very beautiful view. And again, we can zoom right in on that and look at the detail of the, the engraving. You can see even down to individual tool marks and scratches and so on here. Absolutely fantastic resource to be able to do this. Even five years ago, you couldn't do this kind of stuff. You know, th this is the kind of thing where digital technology, both in terms of the photography, but also the fact that this can be made available, broadband speeds and on online databases, all of those things which have developed so much in the last few years uh, mean that now we can do this kind of stuff. When I was doing my PhD on this subject 20 years ago, or not quite 20, but almost feels like it, um, then um, you know I had to actually go and look in books and I had to go to museums if I wanted to look at things. Um, none of that anymore. You, you can do all of this from the comfort of your own home. It, it's a truly fantastic resource. And while we're here, uh, I will just quickly take us to the Sutton Hoo treasure and we can just have a very quick look at that as well, um, because that too is, is absolutely exquisite. And the level of, of detail that you can look at, I know, Sutton Hoo, the level of detail that you can look at the material in is, is truly staggering. So again, I'm, this page has probably been used more than any other in the last few weeks, I would have thought, uh, with all the this popularity surrounding the dig, 
especially. Let's just focus it down. Uh, where are we? I can find it now. Where's it gone? Got loads of stuff on Saturn Who. Can't find it. It's no good, is it? Oh, perhaps I'm not searching closely enough. Let's try again. Elements. There we go. That might work. Oh no, that hasn't worked either. <laughs> oh dear. Embarrassing. Oh no, here we are. There it is. Phew. <laughs> it's not gone wrong. Here we are. So again, we can start to query the, the details of the, the Sutton Hood treasure, for example, uh, in here. So um, again, images that we can zoom right in on. You can see the, the level of detail uh, available there. You can see individual gemstones set into the eyes of the, the, the beast above the, the eyebrows there. You can see where the stones are missing, for example. Yeah, an absolutely exquisite level of detail here um, and all the other objects which are available from, from Sutton Hoo as well. So the National Collection there in, in the British Museum, well worth a, a visit. It, it's an incredible resource. Uh, more locally, of course, um, we do have museums in, in the regions as well still. And uh, so the, the two main museum, well, three main museum collections that we have to deal with are the, the Norfolk Museums collection, which works at a county level. So again, you have a county museum service and uh, their online collection is here. And this is uh, again, a database which we can search. Um, images are being added all the time. This is still a relatively new online development, but um, it, it, you know, it is there. So if I search for the word Viking, for example, I get 10 objects, which seems not very many, but uh, you get the idea. Again, it's, it's early days with the Norfolk online collection. Uh, we can look at this brooch. This is a, a absolutely typical, uh, what we call a, a borrower style brooch with the, the interlace in here with the little knot work. Uh, this is a Scandinavian style brooch, probably made locally, but in a Scandinavian style to be traded and worn by, by local, uh, local uh, population. And this one's on display in Kings Lynn, but we have literally hundreds of these from across the Eastern region. And again, you can add your own comments and, and search here. You can get the, the image larger and have a proper look at that particular object. Uh, we can also search for uh, other things. So if we go back uh, and again, you've got a different type of brooch. You've got what we call a trefoil brooch here. So this is, it's got um, trefoil. So it's got the, the three uh, little lobes to it here and on the back and you've got a a pin which would hold that together. And again, this is an absolutely typical type of, of Scandinavian influenced uh, brooch. And some of these are made as again locally, others are imported. And when we look at them, we can see the differences and we can work out the difference between sort of first and second generation materials coming in. And so again, when we're working through the material from the Breckland area, these are the kinds of things that, that we're wanting to look at. So we've got the Norfolk Museum collections for one. Uh, corresponding to that within Suffolk, we have the Colchester and Ipswich museums, which cover sort of southeast Suffolk and, and down into Colchester and, and um, Suffolk more widely. And then as we get towards uh, the western part of, of the region, uh, we have the, uh, the St Edmundsbury or West Suffolk, as it is now, um, Heritage Service, which again is based out of Moises Hall and runs out of West Stowe as well. And so again, within those collections particularly, uh, we have a, a lot of, of relevant material which can help us in our understanding of the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings in the Brex. Now, Suffolk doesn't have a, a single museum service in quite the same way. And so in addition to that, we also, within the, the Suffolk Archaeological Service, they also have a large archive held by the County Council, a large material archive there. And that archive contains uh, enormous numbers of archaeological objects, including most of the material excavated from Brandon, for example. So again, as part of the, the project, what we're hoping to do as putting the booklet together is to research some of that material and get some of those objects out of storage. And the hope is that some of those will end up being exhibited at Thetford Museum as part of that, that exhibition that I've mentioned previously. So if we want to find out about the objects and the archaeological sites, those are the places that we need to go. You know, we, we go to the historic environment records and find out what we know through them. Uh, we can go to the, the Portable Antiquity Scheme, for example, and find out about the artefacts there. We can go to museum collections as well. And all of those records are interrelated. And so we're able to follow the, the traces from one to another and, and start to, to piece that material together. 
The, the second category that I want to share with you is um, online archaeological journals and online archaeological reports, for example, um, so that we can find out uh, more about the, the fieldwork which has taken place. And again, one of the, the wonderful things that's happened in the last few years as a result of, of the sort of the rise of the internet and the, the rise of digital technology is that a lot of books which were previously only available in hard copy and quite often hadn't had that many copies printed in the first place and were quite difficult to locate, usually in a specialist library. A lot of those books have been digitised and scanned and digitised and put online. And so we're now again in the unenviable position of being able to really just browse to the articles that we're looking for. And so when we're trying to understand the, the history and the archaeology of, of the Breckland area in particular, um, two of the main sets of sources, or three of the main sets of sources that we want to deal with are those published by the Norfolk and Norwich Archaeological Society, uh, which was founded in the mid 19th century and has published a, a journal pretty much every, every year since, and the Suffolk Institute for Archaeology and History, which again started around the same time and has also published a set of, of proceedings pretty much every year ever since. And so both of those societies have their origins in the sort of the, the growing mid 19th century interest in antiquarianism and museums. You know, the, the, the local museums, Norwich Castle, for example, founded at around the same time. Uh, so this is sort of emerging uh, interest across the board in archaeology and history. And so we see the foundation of these learned societies. And again, most counties have a, a county archaeological society of one kind or another. And there are, and some counties have more than one. Norfolk, for example, has, has NARG as well. Hello, Tony, I, I see you out there. And um, so we've, we've got these different groups that produce different publications. And so uh, we're able to research those. And so the main one for Norfolk, I'll start with Norfolk, uh, is Norfolk Archaeology. And this is a journal which, as I said, has been published online every year or published every year, sorry, since 1847. And very recently, as in within the last year, uh, they've had all of the back issues up to 2008 scanned and indexed and placed online through a service called the Archaeology Data Service, which you can see on the screen here. And so what this allows us to do, uh, it's got a search interface again, so we can search for things if we want to. Um, but what it allows us to do is click through to the scanned articles. So uh, if I click on this one to start with, uh, we can go to volume one. Uh, we can sort by page number. Uh, so it starts at the beginning. There we go. And so this is the basically the list of contents for the first issue of Norfolk Archaeology back from 1847. Now, back in the day, you had to go to the library and order up this copy from the store because no one ever bothered to look at it because it was so long ago and there was nothing of interest. Um, but actually, uh, this opens up a whole new set of information for people to use. Uh, I was just trying to scroll down and find something interesting for us to look at. Um, there's bound to be something. Uh, well, what should we go for? Let's click on, I don't know, or agony of choice. Uh, Saxon and Norman Church are great down there. Here we go. So we click on the article. It gives us this little page which says it's been digitised, who it was and so on. We click on the download link and it opens. Here we go. And so here you are. So having, you know, 30 seconds ago decided this was the article we wanted to look at. Uh, we now don't need to add it to our list and wait till we next go to the library. Uh, we simply click on it. And the scanning quality for the Norfolk Archaeology Journal is very, very good as well. I should say. And so all of the images are as, as good as this. Uh, you can read the article. Uh, you've got the illustrations here as well, beautifully detailed, uh, ground plans and so on, going right the way back. And uh, so there's plenty of information in there. And in terms of the, the Vikings and the Brex and, and the Thetford area, for example, again, an enormous number of different articles in that series about uh, Thetford. Um, so if we go for Thetford on there, for example, that should, oh, okay, that should give us a, um, but we can create, oh, so I'm in the wrong tab, here we go. Um, so we can search for Thetford on there, and yeah, as you would expect, we get plenty of, of that. So uh, notes on the Thetford Mint, for example, uh, producing coins, obviously, uh, the Thetford Mint, um, Thetford Castle Hill in there, recent discoveries from Norwich and Thetford. So there's lots of different articles there. Uh, I'm just going to click on the one about the Mint from 1849, and again, 
same screen, just take it through to the article in here and um, we'll just get a, uh, a few thoughts on the uh, on the Thetford Mint in here. I was hoping for a picture, it doesn't give us a picture on that one, but you get the idea. Again, you, you can query for that. And what you'll find is when you're in the Norfolk uh, Historic Environment Record, for example, at the end of the entries that you're looking at, I mentioned before that there's that bibliographic sources box at the bottom of the page. And in that sources box, you'll find references to Norfolk archeology. span And now of course you can then um, cross-reference those straight to the, the scanned archive of, of material, uh, which is online. And that brings us up to 2008. And there are plans to get more recent than that. Most of them have a few years in hand to, to encourage people to still join the societies and, and take the journals, of course, um, with a, a sort of rolling wall behind them. But these are all uh, free to access. You know, this, is, this is the thing. You don't even need to register with the website on this. You just click through and you can access the articles. And so again, you know, an enormous amount of information opened up to, to everybody and uh, hosted by the, the Archaeology Data Service, but promoted by the Norfolk and Norwich Archaeological Society. Now, the Suffolk equivalent of that, uh, as I've already mentioned, is the, the Suffolk Institute for Archaeology and History, uh, which, again, parallel society, broadly the same uh, foundation date, broadly the same history. Uh, and here, too, uh, the uh, digitization of the publications, different approach taken here so that they've been scanned and, and made available online um, by the society itself rather than being hosted by a third party and we can go through to the publications in here uh, a list of, of the volumes in the proceedings uh, here's a page oh, mine doesn't display properly on here but i'll open that instead and so here you've got um, a slightly more uh, simple search interface in the sense that it's just a great long list of the contents going right the way back so you've got 2015 as the most recent hold on to your stomachs if i go right down to the bottom um, you've got the, the earliest one here is, is 1853. Now, all of those articles link to PDFs. What I'm just going to do quickly, those I've done it before, look, I'm going to search for, for Santon on here and uh, an article from 1870. Uh, just click on that. And this is the Scandinavian brooches found at Santon in Norfolk. Now, this was reported in the Suffolk Proceedings for reasons we won't go into but the um the point being that here is the account of how that burial that i just showed you the the brooches from in the british um, museum were was made and so we have the the written description in here as originally published in 1870 um together with some illustrations as well that you've got in there and uh, again a, a sort of a written thing um, by the reverend greenwell here who was uh, prolific at this period in terms of the, the archaeological work that he did and reported on. And of course, within this article, there are references to other articles with comparative sites and so on. And increasingly, those other societies have digitized that material as well, so that we're able to, to cross-reference to other journals. I'm just showing you the examples here of the, the Norfolk and Suffolk Institutes, or the Norfolk Society Suffolk Institute. Uh, but on a national level, for example, just to skip on ahead for a second, We've also got a journal called Medieval Archaeology, which has been running since the 1950s through, and they've got their issues online to 2006. And again, those are all free to access as well, for example. And there are other journal series out there. So there's a lot of material now. And again, when you start with the historic environment records, there are references that you can then follow to all these different places. And again, now it's possible to, to download most of those yourself fairly quickly. Now, a third series that I just want to, to finish this first session, or first part of this session with, are the East Anglian Archaeology Monograph series, um, which you can see the, the home page for here. Now, the East Anglian Archaeology Monographs were begun in the 1970s and have been used ever since to publish, basically, uh, detailed archaeological reports of fieldwork undertaken uh, across the region. And so within that series, which now has about 170, 374 volumes. There are a vast number of different subjects covered, as you can imagine. And again, in recent years, an effort has been made to digitize all of the back issues, as it were, and so that only the most current in print volumes still need to be bought. And ultimately, those will be made available online as well. So here, too, we have a, a fantastic resource available to us. Now, the publications tab at the top here. Uh, they're badged by period to start with, so prehistory, Roman, Anglo-Saxon, medieval, landscape and forthcoming. Uh, but there's also a map search as well, 
uh, which I did a bit of work on for them a while ago now. And so the map search here gives you uh, dots on the maps for where particular um, reports are located. So you can see you've got quite a lot in and around Thetford, for example. You can zoom right in and you can click on a, uh, a particular icon and it will take you to that particular report. And so this is giving us um, Roman and early Saxon occupation at Brettonham, for example. Um, but what I want to do is take us off to Brandon again, because I'm nothing if not obsessed. And so here we go. So Staunch Meadow Brandon, here we go. We click on the tab. And so what this does, I mentioned before that the, uh, the John the Evangelist of the gold plaque was discovered at Brandon by a detectorist in the 70s. Uh, that then precipitated a, an excavation which took place into the 1980s. And uh, as recently as, uh, when was it? it, was 2014, the archaeological monograph based on those excavations was published. And so uh, here, for example, you can download the PDF of that excavation report. And so uh, it was available in print for a while. Uh, it's, it's an important site, the, the report sold out. But if we then click on the download, uh, oh, okay, we download it to there instead. And then um, you can see that chugging away in the background. See the white heat of my Norfolk broadband connection here, chugging away. And uh, then we can open that one in just a second, hopefully. Anytime now, there we go. So we can open that one. And so on the screen, within a matter of moments, you've got the moments, you've got the, the full excavation report here. So again, with reconstruction drawings, for example, and um, then you can scroll through, you've got all the full contents. But the really nice thing about this, of course, is because it's a PDF, it's full color as well. And so you have all of the, uh, the colored maps and plans from the, the report itself are there. And the, uh, the really, really nice thing I scroll down the page on the side here you've got photographs of some of the features you've got the detailed site plans and then as you get towards the back of the report you have all the artifacts as well and you have loads of, of lovely photographs and illustrations and um, so here for example is a selection of anglo-saxon window glass which is a um, very unusual uh, sort of high status um, set of material indicating that the buildings that were on the site are incredibly special uh, in terms of, of what they are, very unusual. And you've got photographs of some of the, the various brooches that were there as well, and um, pieces of vessel glass as well, glass vessels, very high status settlement going on at Brandon, as we would expect from what we'd found of the, uh, of the gold plaque, for example. And then I uh, was just scrolling through, just trying to find, you've got, and um, there's a cemetery on the site as well. So you've got a detailed bone report um, showing uh, photographs of some of the injuries and so it's suggested by the excavators it's not conclusively proven by any means but it's suggested by the excavators that the reason why the the site at Brandon which was almost certainly monastic in its later form um, was abandoned in the ninth century and it's suggested by the, the excavators that the reason for that abandonment might well be the arrival of the Vikings within the, the area, looking at the fact that Brandon and Thetford share a river essentially, and we know that the Vikings are in Thetford in the year 869. The fact that Brandon is then abandoned in the mid 9th century uh, seems to fit very neatly with that particular story. And so again, the, the story of Brandon in particular, uh, here's the drawing of, of John the Evangelist, for example, um, the, um, the story of Brandon in particular is one that we want to bring to the fore uh, in the Anglo-Saxon and, and Vikings booklet because it's an incredibly important site. Uh, although it's been excavated, it wasn't excavated in its entirety either, so there's still a lot more to the site than, than has been excavated so far. And just one of the really nice objects that we have from the, the site, for example, is this one. I think I showed you this one in one of the previous lectures that, that uh, are on the series. And uh, this is a, a an antler tine, so it's the end of an antler uh, which is hollow and is used as an ink well and so there's traces of ink inside it still and then carved down the outside of the tine you've got this little runic inscription and the little runic inscription uh, translates as uh, I grew on a wild animal so again you've got this little anglo-saxon riddle um, carved down the, the side of the uh, ink well there and this is a, a beautiful object and the hope is that this might be one of the objects we're able to display at Thetford as well uh, this is held by the, the Suffolk archaeological service at the county council store and again you know really indicates that not only 
uh, were we dealing with an incredibly sophisticated society uh, during the Anglo-Saxon period in the ninth century especially uh, but we were also dealing of course with a society that, that's very literate and so they're able to, to carve riddles in runes for example but the fact that this is an inkwell as well uh, is also important because as I said there's a strong chance that the Brandon site is an early monastery or, or at least has monastic aspects to it and so the fact that you have uh, inkwells being used indicates that you have uh, manuscripts being created at this particular point in time and the fact that we're finding gold uh, biblical plaques as well with John the Evangelist uh, suggests that we have quite a sophisticated scriptorium set up at least in, in Brandon in this particular period and so uh, that's the kind of thing that the, the evidence is telling us and then when we juxtapose that with uh, what we know of the historical incursion of the Vikings in the mid 9th century it all starts to fit together as rather a nice little story. And that's the story that we want to capture and tell uh, in the, the project booklet that we're putting together. The first half there focused on the, um, the material side of things, on, on archaeological records, archaeological sites. Uh, the second part here, I'm going to focus more on documentary sources and cartographic sources and where you might find those in the sense of aerial photographs and old maps and then uh, original documents as well. So I'm going to start with, again, sort of a crossover to archaeological sites, really. I'm going to start with aerial photographs because one of the really important sources of information that we have as archaeologists are aerial photographs and more recently LIDAR data as well, which is laser scanned uh, data, sort of laser scanning of the ground surface from an aircraft. And the combination of those two methods allows us to identify and particularly earthworks on the surface, um, some of them which can be very subtle, but which represent earlier archaeological sites. Uh, I've already shown you Thetford Castle, for example, as quite a major earthwork, um, but you also have very, very minor ones which might just represent former field boundaries or burial mounds, for example, um, town defences, uh, features of that kind. And so uh, aerial photography is an incredibly useful resource. Uh, of course, we're studying the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings, and so some, some of those features will, will show up, we hope. And of course, if you're interested in other periods as well, there are earthworks and historic buildings from, from all periods, which can be studied in aerial photographs. And of course, then if you're also looking at aerial photography, you have a particularly good record of the 20th century. So aerial photography begins in the 1910s, really, with photographs taken from balloons and so on. And you're able to, to study those photos and look at how the landscape has changed in the course of the 20th century. So military archeologists in particular use aerial photographs taken during various wars in order to uh, categorize and record uh, military sites from the Second World War, First World War. And it allows us to understand the changing townscape as well. Now, there are many different libraries of aerial photographs. The Norfolk, uh, Norfolk Historic Environment record contains the, the Norfolk Air Photo Library. So there's an extensive library of, of photographs from, from Norfolk and there's a Suffolk equivalent, which is not quite so extensive, but which is held by the Suffolk Record Office. There's a large collection at Cambridge University, uh, which used to be able to be visited in person, but which is in the process of being digitised. But the main air photographic library is held in Swindon and is now managed by Historic England. And so the website that you can see on the screen at the moment is called Britain from Above. And this is a website which is primarily uh, promoting Historic England's air photo collections. And what you can do, th this website has two levels of, of um, interaction. There was a, a question in the comments box uh, about um, subscriptions and whether websites need subscriptions and so on. Um, all of the websites I showed you before the break don't require or, or, any, or even a login, uh, you just use them. But some of them you have the option to create a user account which will allow you to add comments to some of the records or, or to access a bit more detail. And the same is true of, of most of the websites I'll show you in this half as well, although there are a couple where uh, a subscription gives you a, an extra level of information. So one of those is, is Britain from Above, which is this online record of um, aerial photography. And so what you can do, I've created a user account, it's free, you, ju you just create it and that allows you to zoom in a bit more on some of the images and to tag features in the images, uh, but you can use it without a, a login as well. 
Um, but if I just search for, uh, if I just put Thetford in the search box, again, as, as a good local example, and it gives us, here we are, immediately gives us a catalogue of all the historic photographs, air photographs in that collection, or not all of them, but a good selection of them that relate to Thetford. It should be stressed, there are a lot of photographs that they haven't digitised as well. Um, but for example, this one, let's click on the top left, the first one that comes back, and this is giving us Thetford Castle, and this is taken in 1928. So this is a very early photograph. I'm just going to hide the pins for a second so that you don't see those. And um, so you've got the earthworks of the castle. And this is a very useful record in itself, visual record, um, because it gives us how um, overgrown the castle was, for example, at this particular point in time. You can see all the, the tree growth. A lot of this is not here now. There certainly aren't trees growing out the top of it anymore. So it gives you quite a, a nice... Uh, view of that but then also because you've got all the peripheral detail as well so you've got this close-up view if you can zoom right in for example on the um, on the Thetford Maltings here for example in the background uh, which gives us a, a detailed view of some of the industrial buildings that, that were being used at this particular point in time so there's a lot of information contained within the photographs although the primary focus of this image is the castle itself now, I'm able to zoom in and out like that because I've created my user account. Um, it will encourage you to do that. Uh, what you can also do, you've got pins which have been added here. So anyone who's logged in can tag things in the photograph and add um, little comments of their own. So people have been through and identified particular buildings and so on on there as well, just to add that extra level of information. And I could add a new one of my own if I wanted to as well. And then what you can also do is download um, a copy of the image there if you've got a user account and you can buy copies of the high resolution one if you wish to do so as well. So if you find a picture of your house or somewhere that you're interested in, uh, it's perfectly possible to do that. So just giving you a selection of what they've got for Thetford here, for example, uh, you can see a lot of images from the 1920s, uh, which are, are interesting in and of themselves. And then as I go down the page, they get more recent. You've got some from 1950s here as well, 1951. This is 1946, uh, a nice detailed view of the ruins of the Priory, for example. Again, you can see how overgrown they are. People have tagged the various buildings in the background as well, uh, just to give you a little bit of extra information. And so the, the Britain from Above um, website covers the whole country and has this selection of, of images. And you can search by the map again. So we go to the map and again, sort of familiar uh, interface where you can click on the uh, certain areas and it will give you um, a group of images. So we click on the Brandon one, for example. Uh, so you get the little pins for what we're looking at. And zoom in and it gives you the locations of particular photos that you are interested in looking at. And you can uh, you can start to query the, the website that way. So there's a lot of information contained on there and you can use that uh, for all kinds of things. Um, but particularly, as I say, for, for the 20th century stuff, uh, they are particularly useful. Now, complementing air photos, uh, we also have historic maps. And so there's a number of different places that you can go to view historic maps. But primarily, one of the, the most useful places these days is the National Library of Scotland uh, website, which contains an enormous number of digitised ordnance survey maps in particular, of the entire country. There's a few little gaps, but overall, uh, it's, it's very, very good. There are different ways of doing it. Uh, I'll just show you a couple. So the first one is their um, map finder with outlines. This lets you find um, individual map sheets. Uh, let's click through that for a second. So you've got the whole country divided up into Ordnance Survey map sheet coverage, and you can choose uh, on the box at the top left here. Uh, you can choose uh, to places that you would like to go. You can so you've got a different map. Sorry, click the wrong button. You've got different map uh, series there that you can choose from, and then you can choose the thing. So we're going to go for the 25 inch maps, which were the more detailed ones, which you can see uh, in here. So each of those squares represents a uh, historic map. And then we'll go to the middle of Thetford. Uh, here we go. So we'll click on that one. And so that grid square there, you then get the maps that they hold on the right hand side which includes the first edition on here. So I click on the first edition uh, on there and we can zoom right in on the detail of the first edition Ordnance Survey map for that particular area. 
uh, right on the screen down to the level of individual buildings. And because it's the first edition, all of the trees that are shown are in the right place. Uh, all of the buildings shaded pink are occupied. All of the buildings shaded gray are outbuildings. All of the buildings shaded blue are and crosshatched are glass houses. And then you've got water, bodies of water marked on there as well. So an incredibly detailed set of mapping, the first edition ordnance survey. You can work through it sheet by sheet, uh, which is all rather nice. And um, what you can also do uh, is you can, I'm just going to go up to here, see if we can do this. Um, you can, not that one, get rid of that one, get rid of that one, uh, this one. Uh, what you can also do is then um, interrogate the, the detail. So, um, for example, this is the map at the edge of Santon. You can see the, uh, the railway line coming through. I think I actually wanted the sheet one further over than that. So we'll ditch that one. Um, I think it's this one that we're actually looking at. Uh, if we go to the first edition again, here we go. Um, so on here, for example, you can see uh, you've got the various different plantations mentioned on here. And when you cross-reference this to the, uh, the article which describes the discovery of those brooches, for example, uh, you can quickly identify some of the, the features on the ground that they're referring to, and you can pick up a, a detailed view of, of where those objects were found. So an incredibly useful resource. You see, I'm just clicking through. Um, here we go. So this is the one I meant. So we're told about uh, some of the features nearby. Uh, we're told that those brooches come from an old gravel pit, uh, and we're able to quickly identify the features on the map and identify the old gravel pit, for example. So it allows us to, to very, very quickly and work out where we are and, and where things were from. Now this lets us do this on a sheet by sheet basis. Um, the first edition usually dates from the 1880s or so. And then there's a, a second edition from the early 20th century. And then sometimes a third edition from the 20s. Uh, urban areas go, you sometimes have more than that. It will take you through to the 40s or 50s. And so again, if you're interested in looking at a particular period, uh, you can follow the maps through and see how uh, a site changes over time, for example. Uh, the more recent editions beyond the first edition don't have as much detail uh, just because of the sort of financial reasons as much as anything, uh, but an incredibly useful resource nonetheless. Now, what the other thing that the, uh, the National Library of Scotland lets you do, just go back to their starting page again, which is here somewhere. Now let's open a new one. Uh, uh, no, that one, open another one then. Uh, so what it lets you do is, where's it gone? It's gone down that end. There we go. What it lets you do as well is this side-by-side -side viewer. So um, what you can do if you're trying to compare the modern landscape to the historic landscape, for example, uh, on the one side, you've got the, uh, the air photo, which you can change to having it as a, um, a map as well to help you navigate, work out where you are. So we'll take it down to the Thetford area and you can see how the, the mapping is moving on one side and the, the mapping is moving on the other, keeping it in parallel. And then on this side, the left hand side, we can change the, the base mapping that we're interested in and we can start to see how features change over time. So if I zoom right into that arbitrary junction in Thetford, for example, um, you can then move your cursor and it moves down both maps together and you can start to see which features survive and which features disappear. And you can do that with a variety of different map sources through here. You've got all kinds of different things uh, mixed up in there, as you can see, um, to showing you different things. And you can compare that then to the, the modern base map on the other side. And you've got this swipe feature as well, which is even nicer, where you can overlay one on top of the other. And you can basically take the map uh, one way or the other to show you what it is that you want to look at like that. Uh, and you can obviously zoom in and out as well. So an incredibly useful resource on the, the National Library of Scotland. As I say, one of the probably one of the most used mapping resources out there and always well worth a look if you're looking to, to track down historic ordnance survey. Invariably they haven't got the one you're always interested in, um, but that is the case with archives in general, I'm afraid. Um, but there is a, an enormous coverage for East Anglia on here, uh, which is exceptionally good. And so that's one of, of my most regularly visited websites in terms of checking out historic mapping. And there is a, another website called oldmaps.co.uk, 
which offers a, a similar service, uh, albeit on a, a slightly um, less good graphical quality scale, shall we say. Uh, again, this one you can create a user account for, and um, that allows you additional functionality, but you don't have to pay, uh, or no, you, you do have to pay a little bit for a user account on this one, sorry. Um, but you can still use it when you're when you're not a paid member. And I'm a paid member just because it gets you extra level of detail when you're trying to look at, at particular buildings and landscapes. Um, but you still get a lot of, of useful information, uh, even when you're not. And that's not going to work today, is it, hopefully? So um, again, exactly the same idea. You search for a particular area. We'll give it one more go. Search for an area. And um, then you can see historic mapping from all those different periods overlaid one on top of the other. Uh, but the mapping on here takes you up to the 1970s. So again, if you're looking for more recent features, uh, you can pick it up on there. That's not going to play with us this morning. I'm going to not try and do that. And uh, so old maps, again, is, is another uh, useful resource for that. Um, another source of old maps, if you're interested in trying to track down the tithe maps, for example, um, one recent development is a website called The Genealogist, which is a, a rival to Ancestry in the sense that it's primarily a family history website. But one of its unique selling points here is that it has a digitized archive of all of the tithe maps from the UK and um, together with the tithe apportionment maps as well, which are the bits that tell us about the, the landscape. Now you do have to have a subscription for this one. Uh, and if you use tithe maps as often as I do, uh, it's incredibly useful. Um, but I, I'm, I'll show you this to so you know what it can do. Uh, rather than to encourage you to, to buy one for yourself necessarily. Um, if we go to, uh, let's try Thetford again. Here we go. We might not have that many tithe maps for Thetford because it's primarily urban, uh, thinking about it. But, um, and we've got a Thetford in Cambridgeshire as well. So let's go for Thetford, Norfolk. But what, what it lets you do, again, if you're primarily, if you're a family historian, and you're attempting to research your family, obviously the, all the, the genealogical information is there, but particularly I'm interested in it because it lets you do this. So you find a particular entry for Thetford, you can zoom right out, oh, this is getting sluggish already. Um, you can zoom right out. Um, I can switch off the pins for a second. Uh, where's it gone? Hide pins, there we go. So you've got all these scans of the tithe maps from across the country, uh, which you can then uh, it zoom in and interrogate. Now this gives us a picture of usually the early 19th century landscape, but again can give us useful details in terms of landowners, field names and buildings and so on. Tithe maps are incredibly well surveyed, they give us a, a very good picture of the landscape. And what I've done, the, the pins on here, because this is a family history website primarily, uh, all of the pins on here, you click on it and it tells you who owns which plot of land at that particular point in time and who is occupying it. And if I click on the transcript button as well, uh, it takes me through and gives me the names, gives me the dates and other information. And I can click through again and I, it will take me to the original document as well, which is incredibly useful for, for people who are doing landscape historical research in particular, because not only do you have the landowner and the occupier on here, you have the field name and a description uh, which can be incredibly useful. It, it might give you a clue, you know, is it Mill Field? Is it Gallows Hill? You know, you, you get those local names that sometimes capture what's going on in the landscape at that particular point. It gives you the cultivation and then the dimensions of the value as well, which again, if you're doing different things, you, you can do that. So to be able to access all those tithe maps in this way, if that's something that you're interested in doing, if that's something you're trying to, to research, it, it's an incredibly useful resource to have. But as I say, that one does require an annual subscription and unlike Ancestry doesn't appear to be available for free through the libraries either and so it's a little bit of a, a niche product but um, it is a useful thing to have. In terms of Suffolk maps and, and air photos um, we have a project underway through the, the development of the hold which is the, the Suffolk record office project which I gather will lead to the digitization of, of more Suffolk maps and those being placed online. In terms of Norfolk we have a, a website called the Norfolk Historic Map Explorer, which has been around for about 15 years or more now in one form or another. It's just in the process of being updated for the new technology uh, that drives it. And so this is a, a working version that's available online at the moment. And what this allows you to do is take your map of Norfolk uh, on the screen, here we are, 
and look at different layers from different periods. So this is the 1946 uh, air photos. If I zoom in somewhere we know, that would be a good start, wouldn't it? Let's go to depth again for the want of an alternative. And so um, what we can do is we can switch on the 1946 aerial photo layer. And you can see from the zoomed out version, what they've done here is stitched together a whole series of photographs and overlapped them to create this map. So the resolution is not brilliant, although it's pretty good. And you can zoom right in and get a view of the landscape in the 1940s. Now, this is quite useful because, as you can imagine, Thetford has changed quite a lot since the 1940s. And so a lot of the peripheral areas of the town, especially, have subsequently been developed. And so this is giving us a view of what survived in the fieldscapes before the town expanded, for example. Um, but because it's taken in the 40s as well, it also gives us a, a detailed view of many of the military installations as well, uh, which still survived at this particular period. Uh, those photos are complemented by a Norfolk County Council series taken in the 1980s, uh, 1988 this is, um, and you can see this, this big scar through the landscape here is the construction of the Thetford Bypass, uh, the A11 Bypass, and you can see that as a work in progress running through the fields in the 1980s, just as a, a, a side really. Um, tucked in, uh, we have um, large numbers of, of archaeological sites that we know about as well. Um, so the area to the north of Thetford in here, for example, uh, there's a major site in here of a Romano-British um, and uh, Iron Age and Romano-British temple site in here at Fison Way. Uh, this is uh, a very large site. There are online, um, the East Anglian Archaeology Monograph online has a, has a couple of books about that that you can read as an incredibly important site. And it just sits now inside the industrial estate of the A11, just to the north of Thetford. Uh, so we've got the 88 photos. We've also got enclosure maps, uh, which not all of which have been scanned for Norfolk. As you can see, there are quite a lot of gaps. Um, but where they exist, there's one, uh, the enclosure maps are very useful. These usually date from the late 18th century, and they record the state of the land, usually before it was redesignated and, and redistributed. So you end up with a, a, a ghost, if you like, of all this, the medieval strip fields uh, in here surviving. And uh, again, you can go and track down the originals of those in the record office. I've shown you tithe maps already through the, the genealogist website, but the Norfolk eMap Explorer, uh, as it used to be called, um, also has, if I zoom out slightly, also has tithe maps or extracts of some tithe maps on it. And they've been cut out and stuck together to create this seamless layer of, of tithe maps, which you can, again, it, without the need for a subscription here, you can zoom in and, and investigate uh, the plot numbers and so on on there and then you can go back to the record office and find the extra information and then you've got the ordnance survey first edition on here as well so as well as the the um the scottish um, library map service uh, you've also got this on here so another very important resource now i mentioned as well more recently i mentioned lidar which is laser scanning of the, the ground surface uh, this is a bit again a bit more of a niche product in the sense that uh, it's digital data and you need certain pieces of software to be able to interrogate it and use it. And there are other strands of the, the projects, the current project of the, uh, the Fen Edge and Rivers project, which are aimed at teaching people how to use that software. So keep an eye out for, for those. Um, but the LiDAR imagery um, is available nationwide through the Environment Agency. They've, they've got national coverage now pretty much. And you can download that for free and you can then load it into the software and interrogate it. And that will give you um, detailed views of, of, again, earthworks and so on. LiDAR has the benefit of being able to see through the trees as well, uh, because the lasers are, are so small that they, they can zip between the leaves and hit the ground. So you can actually see earthworks inside forested areas. And so as part of the recent Breaking New Ground project, a LiDAR survey of Thetford Forest was undertaken. And so within the Brex area, at least, or as part of it, uh, we have, uh, map tiles available. This is going to load very slowly. Hang on. We'll let that chug away. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. Try again. There we go. And um, so what we have within the, you can see the grids here within the, the Breckland area. And um, so what you can do is you can click on a square and it takes you to a graphic image. And this is showing you a version of the LiDAR data. So you can see on here um, earthworks that survive. You can see little stripes there, which represent 
very slight banks on the ground. You can see the remnants of roadways and so on shown in here, as well as the river channels. So it's incredibly detailed imagery. And with the right software, as I say, you can then process that imagery further and get your own uh, details out of it as well and start to make more of it. Um, but these, these rough uh, printouts here at least give you an idea of the kind of thing that, that LIDAR can do for you. Now, as I say, I won't dwell on LIDAR today, but it's just to make you aware of, of this particular product from the previous projects, and you can find some reports and so on online that use it. Um, but other aspects of the project in the future will be looking at how you can use that data uh, on, a, on a, a wider footing, and so keep a lookout for that. Uh, another um, standard reliable is, is Google Earth as well. Again, um, we're all so much more familiar now looking at satellite imagery than we were uh, even five years ago. Um, Google Earth in its web browser version allows you to, to zip around the world. You can visit the pyramids, you can do what you like. Um, but even more so, the downloadable version. Uh, if you download the Google Earth Pro for desktop, for example, um, what that has, when you load that as a program, it, it loads the mapping that we're familiar with through the web browser. But under the menu, for under the view menu, it also has a historical imagery tab as well, which allows you to scroll back through satellite images, some of which will take you back to the early 1990s, remember those? And um, some of them have the 1940s air photos loaded in as well for certain areas. So again, if you're interested in a particular site or how something might have changed or how uh, particularly buildings in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, which some of us are, then again, the, the historical mapping, um, a historical imagery section of the Google Earth program is particularly useful for that. So again, that, that's there as, a, as quite a valuable research tool. And for things like earthworks and crop mark sites, for example, um, which show up, again, lots of those captured on, on Google Earth imagery. And so um, the crop mark sites, for example, where you've got a buried archeological site that uh, affects the way the crop grows over the top of it, they show up very, very clearly in, in several sets of the Google Earth images. And so again, you know, there are archaeological features shown on those maps. And quite often, if you look at them in conjunction with the historic environment records, for example, you can pick up where uh, those features are and what they are. And there are others which haven't yet been recorded. So again, if you spot something and you can't find it on the historic environment record, for example, um, get in touch with them and, and see, because that might well be a new site being discovered. So again, there are uh, sort of, it, it works in both directions in terms of uh, information in and information out. So again, if we spot new things, we, we should report them to the historic environment records. And then just for the last quarter of an hour or so, I just want to move to documentary sources in the sort of more conventional sense as well, because increasingly uh, we're able to draw upon the contents of record offices and uh, archives and libraries through online resources as well. And again, this is one of the wonderful things about the internet is that people have digitized this stuff and made it available. So uh, within Norfolk and Suffolk, the, the primary repositories for uh, original historical documents are the, the Norfolk Record Office and the Suffolk Archive Service. So the Suffolk Record Office, both of those have websites, uh, which I can just open for you here. So the Norfolk one, again, is, is got an online catalog details of the search room and so on. Um, but there isn't as yet a lot of material available online through the, the Norfolk service, although things are being digitized and are gradually uh, coming uh, online. Uh, there's a copying service and so on, and obviously you can keep in touch with them. And once the e restrictions start to ease, the, um, the online or the search room functions will, will be available. We can go and actually look at documents in person again. And so, um, you know, there is material there, um, but it's primarily the catalogues that, that are helpful for the Norfolk Record Office. Uh, Suffolk Archives, again, I mentioned the hold earlier on, which is the new um, Uber Record Office being built in, in Ipswich. And uh, to go with that, there's an enormous amount of digital content being developed as well. And so increasingly, we're finding uh, more and more of the Suffolk documentation being scanned and placed online. And obviously during the course of the last year or so, the staff have had quite a lot of, of opportunity to, uh, to digitize material and, and get that kind of thing on. So again, through the Suffolk Archives website, you can search for information. You can start to click through and find material. And if it hasn't been digitized yet, you can put in 
request to uh, to have material digitized and sent to you and uh, so we can do that uh, those are the regional record offices they're complemented by the national archive and again those of you who what you know who do you think you are and that kind of thing well i'm sure i've seen people posing outside the national archive in queue uh, which is where uh, we we see it uh, there it is here um, obviously again the, the public bit temporarily closed at the moment but the the national archive have made a lot of material available online so if you create yourself a user account and again it's free um, you can log in you can search their catalogue and you can request copies of documents that they've already scanned and they'll email those to you for free and uh, so there's a lot of material on there in terms of of what we're doing Perhaps one of the most exciting and interesting aspects of, of what they're up to is that they hold the Doomsday book. I'll just open their Doomsday page um, on here. So um, again, when we're looking at the Anglo-Saxon area, uh, the Doomsday book of 1086 really marks the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, but gives us a really interesting picture of what was going on in 1066. So we get a snapshot of the late Anglo-Saxon landscape and who owned it and all the various resources that it had. And then it tells us how the Normans changed that. So from our understanding of, of the Anglo-Saxon period in the region, what Doomsday tells us about the Breckland area is incredibly useful and important. And um, so the Doomsday book, or more than one, there's, there's Great Doomsday, which covers most of the country. And then there's what's called Little Doomsday, which covers um, Norfolk and Suffolk and Essex. And so um, Little Doomsday is the one we're interested in, and that has a lot more detail in it than the main book. It seems to have been a, an early um, early draft, if you like, that wasn't then standardised and summarised into, the, uh, into the, the, the Great Doomsday book. But through the archives website here, uh, you can read about the background to the survey. Um, you can, it links to the um, English translations, which we have, which is obviously uh, a very useful way of doing it and the penguin classics have a version that you can pick up and read and then um you've got guides to research and so on as well about how you can actually um how you actually use doomsday and what it's for what it tells you and, and so on which is is also uh, incredibly useful now what you can do uh, with this is you can search for a particular place and once you've searched for your particular place it will uh, so if I search for Thetford, for example, on here, oops, search for, uh, start again, search for Thetford on here, there we go. Um, what it does, here we go, it gives you all of the different pages of the Doomsday Survey in which Thetford is mentioned. And obviously it's mentioned quite a lot because it's a large area with lots of different land holdings. So if I just, you've got 221 results, but I've got the first one on here. Uh, it tells us, uh, here we go, so we've got the, uh, the, the, um, Stigand or Stigand, the Archbishop of Con and Canterbury owns land in Thetford. And so if we want to preview an image of that record, we click on there and it gives us a little uh, thumbnail view. If it loads, here we go, ignore the watermark. It gives you a little thumbnail view of the actual page of the Doomsday Survey uh, in there. And then um, what we can do if we log in and get that for free, uh, I won't show you my password, but if you log in, um, you can. Um, you can just add it to your basket for free. You can have up to 10 items per basket, 100 items in 30 days. And you just say, yes, please, I'd like that one. But you click through and then uh, you, you check out. And within a couple of hours, they've emailed you the image. So you can have a, an extracted page of the Doomsday Survey for your particular area. And it, it, they, there are lots and lots of digitized documents on there, which you can do. And as you can see on the banner at the top here, while there's limited access online, you can download records for free. Uh, normally you'd have to pay um, but at the moment because of covid they've suspended all of that so again you know there's plenty of interesting research to be done in there on all kinds of different things not just the doomsday survey you can use it for family history and all sorts of other things that you, you might want to do so you know now is the time to to capitalize on on that one as well so that's a, an incredibly useful resource and then just to round off with some pretty things really as much as anything and uh, the other thing that, that has happened is that uh, all of the, the manuscripts, or lots of the manuscripts, which we would want to study have been digitised as well and are available online. And so the uh, British Library has a, a digitised 
manuscript section now, which has uh, large numbers of, of their manuscripts available to be browsed. Um, particular highlights, as you can see on here, you've got the, the um, St Cuthbert Gospel, for example, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, so you just click on the image and then you get photograph after photograph of the pages. Now, obviously, a lot of these written in Latin or, or Old English, I wouldn't necessarily expect to be able to read those. I can't. Um, but it does let you get a sense of what the document looks like. And again, like with all these things, you can zoom right in on the detail and start to see uh, what's there. And of course, you can uh, leaf through all of these. Now, digitized manuscripts are, are very good. What I've done, I've picked out a few examples of things that we're particularly interested in. Um, so you've got the British Library is one resource. There's the Parker Library at Cambridge University, which has uh, an enormous number of, of beautiful manuscripts, which they've digitized as well. And the Cambridge Library, University Library, has an increasingly digital footprint as well in terms of digitizing their own sources. So there's a lot to be had there. Um, but I've just pulled out on here some of the ones that are nice for us. There's an example from the Morgan Library, uh, which is in America. And this is a, um, a Life and Miracles of St Edmund. And what it does is it gives us beautiful views of uh, many of the images uh, of telling the story of the life of Edmund. And these are all available online. Just scroll through so you can see the, the Vikings coming. This is the Viking army. Uh, here they are meeting with, with Edmund. Uh, there's uh, being crowned king. And so as we scroll through, you can see the Vikings saying to Edmund to come and see them. Here they are. You see the image we've been using as the publicity image to do with the, the project here. Uh, there's battles, as you can see, going on there. And then as we come through, we start to get to the miracle of Edmund himself uh, being illustrated here. I'll just scroll through. Uh, so there's Edmund being led off to see the Vikings, dragged to his throne, beaten with a stick. Uh, here he is being shriven. Uh, there we are tied to his tree. And, and here we are. So here you have the, um, the martyrdom of Edmund as depicted in this manuscript. And this is one in Bury St Edmunds in the 12th century. So it's a, a contemporary uh, monastic document from the Abbey in Bury. And again, you know, beautifully digitised so that you can zoom right in. Or you, or you could do. Is it gone? Come on. No, it's not going to. OK, but you can zoom right in and, uh, and see the detail of the images right down to the individual uh, pen strokes and so on on the, the illustrations there absolutely exquisite. So that's a, a beautiful collection. Uh, we have another example of a Berry document. This is um, John Lydgate's Life of Edmund. And again, uh, this is a, a fantastic document. And the viewer through the British Library in this particular instance allows us just to, to flick through the pages. It takes a little while to get going. As you can see, there's quite a few blank pages at the front. Um, but when we get going, in a minute, here we go, get the catalogue entries. So you start to have these wonderful images. And these, again, illuminated manuscript. This is 15th century this time, comes from Bury St Edmunds and uh, is telling the story of Bury St Edmunds as a poem. It's, it's in rhyme. Um, but one of the really nice things about this one is it has lots and lots of lavish illustrations. So here you've got the, the three crowns. Uh, those MR James enthusiasts out there will know about the three crowns um, representing the, the kingdom of East Anglia. And so uh, here we have some beautiful, these are some of our only contemporary views, for example, of the Shrine of Edmund in, in Bury St Edmund's Abbey. And there are several different views of it reproduced in this document. And, and so again, you know, these manuscripts, if you wanted to look at them in person, you, you'd have to have um, special permission, as they say, and you'd have to go down to the, the British Library and have to pull them out of the archives, justify why you wanted to look at them and, and turn the pages incredibly carefully. And um, here we can zoom right in and just have a look at the beautiful artwork from the 15th century. It is absolutely exquisite. And we can just do that from our desktop. Didn't used to be able to do that at all. It's, it's fantastic. Um, other documents available to us, we've got Bede's Ecclesiastical History, for example, um, has been digitized again by the British Library. Um, I won't necessarily again expect to be able to read it, um, but it, it gives you a flavor of what's going on. Um, for the references, I should just say the F on here stands for folio, which is the equivalent of a page. And then the R is what's called a recto. Uh, so that's the right hand side. As you look at a book, the recto is the right hand side. And then the verso is the back. So when you see uh, a, a number, that gives you the, the sheet and then the recto and the verso at the front and the back. And so you can do. So this is one of the earliest copies of Bede's 
ecclesiastical history. And that's where we get a lot of our information about Anglo-Saxon East Anglia in particular. So we get all the mentions of, Re of Redwold and Rendlesham and all of those things that we know about the East Anglian story, about the bishopric and so on. All of that comes from the pages of, of Bede's ecclesiastical history. And again, you know, we can flick through it as if it were in front of us. It's quite incredible. Uh, here's another classic. Uh, this is Beowulf. And uh, again, um, it's a, an interesting aside, but uh, some people have suggested that Beowulf was perhaps written in East Anglia, uh, which is, is one possibility. It's not widely supported, but it, it is a, a, a possibility. And um, of course, with Beowulf, uh, the story has, is a Scandinavian story, um, but has many parallels to, uh, to what's going on in, in this country. And it allows us to understand things like the Sutton Hoo burial, for example, and, uh, and other things. And so um, with this one, uh, we can find the, uh, the, the Beowulf text, which starts about part of the way through. Where does it start? Uh, where has it gone? Lost it now. What's there? Uh, anyway, it gives you the, uh, the, the Beowulf manuscript. Uh, we can definitely find it if we go to this page. This is the online edition of Beowulf. Uh, which gives you the text and the text in translation, which is quite nice. Uh, here we go. So um, the really, really nice thing, just as a, as a complete uh, aside, is that we only have one manuscript copy of Beowulf. Uh, and if it, it, it was involved in a fire, uh, it, belonged, it was in a library called the Cottonian Library, which is a, a manuscript collection uh, put together by a, a gentleman called Cotton. And um, his library caught fire and many of the manuscripts that were in it perished, and a lot of them were saved. Beowulf was one of the ones that was saved. You can see from the photo that the edges of the pages are quite ragged where the book started to burn, um, but we still have one copy, and it's the only copy of Beowulf. And if that had perished in the fire, we'd know nothing about it, basically. So here's the first, um, here's the first page of the, uh, the Beowulf story, bound into a, a wider book, which is why I couldn't find the page on the other one. Um, but here it is. Uh, so you've got that first line there, wait, where Gardena in Gardeum. Yeah, you've got uh, stop, listen, I'll tell you a tale. A fantastic story for Beowulf. And the fact that we're able again to, to flick through the pages of that online uh, when there's only the one manuscript in the world is, is uh, absolutely incredible. And then another documentary source I just want to share with you again is the, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle as well. And I've already mentioned, of course, the the references in previous lectures to the Vikings overwintering in Thetford, for example, and uh, the martyrdom of Edmund being recorded in there. And so there are many different versions of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It's like a little family tree. And so one of them starts off as the original copy uh, and the beginning is then copied into other places. And then each of the other places carries it on in their own right later on. And so um, this one is the Peterborough edition, if you like, of the, the manuscript. Uh, which is carried on in, in Peterborough. We can search the contents. Uh, so let's try that, see what we can find. So here we go, folio 30 verso, so the back of, of sheet 30. And here is the entry um, about the Vikings overwintering in Thetford. Um, so here's the year. Uh, so that's um, it's actually 870 they've got down there, but we now think 869. And, and so it's in Old English. And then here you can see Thetford, there's the word Thetford in there. Uh, there's the word Edmund in there, you can pick that out, Edmund King, you can see that in there as well. So that's giving you the story of the Vikings overwintering in Thetford and, uh, and the martyrdom of Edmund. Only a couple of lines, but it, it tells us about that. And so the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, again, is something that we're keen to use as the basis of, of some of the story we're telling in the booklet, because it gives us that framework of historical dates and events and records the Viking raids, various Viking raids that take us through to the 11th century and beyond. And so again, we'll be using it in translation, but we'll be using those extracts. And it'd be nice to include some little screenshots of the, uh, the original documents there as well, if we can. And uh, so that again is another fantastic resource and on Doomsday Book I've already mentioned. And then just very, very quickly, just to finish off, I also want to emphasize that it's not just the primary sources that have been digitized. There, there is a lot of um, antiquarian books and so on that have been digitized as well out there. And so there's a website called the Internet Archive, which has uh, large collections of books, particularly from American university libraries, which have been digitized. And 
So, for example, if we want to look at, at 19th century works on various aspects of, of East Anglian history, a lot of those are there digitised and we can use those. Um, similarly, Google Books as well have, have scanned a lot of, of classic works uh, which we're able to access. So Google Books too is, is an incredibly useful resource for, for those sorts of sources. And then for more contemporary research, we've got things like academia.edu, uh, which is where academics, many of them upload copies of their, their dissertations and upload copies of the articles and so on that they've written. And so again, if you create yourself a login for the academia website, you can quite often download um, research papers and articles for, from people there. Uh, so it's always worth a look. Um, other digitised sources, we've got the Victoria County histories as well, which again are uh, ongoing histories of the, um, the background to, to different counties, as the name suggests. We have two volumes each for Norfolk and Suffolk. Uh, the first volume concerns uh, the, quite a lot of its sort of geology and natural history. Volume two is primarily given over to monastic houses and so on. And so we have quite a lot of detailed history for uh, Norfolk and Suffolk in there. And again, things like the Santon brooches discovered in the, the late 19th century um, get a good write-up in the uh, Victoria County histories. And then the British Library, as well as doing all the digitised manuscripts, the British Library also has a, um, a library of um, doctoral theses as well. So um, people who've, who've undertaken doctoral research on different aspects of East Anglian history, particularly its Anglo-Saxon origins and so on, a lot of their PhD theses, again, previously only available in one or two copies in a university library, uh, are now available as PDFs. Again, you create yourself a free account there. You can log in and, and basically download those and, and read those as well. A lot of those obviously subsequently translated into books and, and articles, but there's still a lot of good unpublished information out there which can be used uh, for that too. So um, again, a, an incredibly useful resource. Now, that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, I know, um, through the sorts of, sort of breadth of sources which are uh, available to you out there. As I've mentioned on the way through, the vast majority of those websites that I've shown you are free, and you can access that material without the need to create a user account. Some of them, if you create a user account, it gives you extra functionality, and uh, you can get a bit more detail, and, and you can interact with the website a bit more easily. And then there's a couple on there, which I've mentioned, where you do need a subscription, um, particularly to the genealogist of the tithe maps, but that's a bit more specialised in and of itself. So uh, I wouldn't worry about that. But the, the vast majority of it on there, as I say, you can access freely, available online and use it in your own research. And so that is very much what I wanted to share with you this morning. I'm just going to come off and uh, do the um, go back to the, the other view. Uh, I hope that there's been something for everybody in there. I hope that that was uh, uh, useful to you. I didn't mention all the various online lectures which are available as well, of course, you know, our own being some of them, but um, many, many uh, learned societies who, who hold lectures have started recording them and putting them online, um, making these things available for free nationwide. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good material out there now that wasn't even there a year ago. But uh, thank you again very much to all of you for, for coming. And uh, I hope to see some of you at least again online soon.